let's start. Imagine this code runs in your uh, production systems. Who can tell me what's wrong with it? Yes, this is a classic deadlock situation. Uh, we have here two threads locking two mutexes in a wrong order, and they just stuck. And then we have our main thread releases the deadlock after sleeping for 20 seconds, and then the program terminates. This is, whoa, it's big. The, 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 this is a picture of a deadlock. Again, here we have two threads that lock their objects, and then they try to lock the opposite objects. And they, and they just get stuck here. And a deadlock situation is just one example of a performance issue you may have on a production system. Now, I have some great news today. We have a new superpower in Linux. It's called the eBPF. eBPF lets you root cause analyze almost any performance issue you might have on a production system on a running production system. Uh, so you don't have to change any of your code. And by running one bash command, for our example, we can uh, get a visualization of the whole runtime to something like this. So this is a graph. It's called a hot cold flame graph. And the blue color shows us the call stack of what our process was doing when it was not running on the CPU, meaning when it was off CPU, where, where it was idle and wh why. So here, uh, and, and the orange colors show you where it was running, when it was running on the CPU. And clearly here we were, we were just idle most of the time. So we can see that 50% of our idle time, we just sleep for 20 seconds, which is not surprising, right? Because we had this sleep for 20 seconds thing. But the most interesting part here is that we wait 50% of our idle time waiting on locks. Now, this is a performance issue. It looks like a performance issue. To, uh, today, I'm going to show you how you can root cause analyze your applications using Python and uh, the BPF technology. My name is Pavel, and I'm a performance and cloud engineer at Final. Final is a world-leading high-frequency trading company. We develop trading algorithms, and we try to predict the market. I, myself, uh, work with Linux for 10 years now, both kernel and user space. And me and my team are currently working on giving a better visualization of our performance issues to our developers. So they can just click and get their uh, root cause their performance issues of their applications. At Final, we really try to build our software with a lot of simplicity in mind. And we try for it to look something like this. But in reality, guess what happens? It looks like this. And like in any other production uh, system, uh, performance issues will happen to you. You cannot escape from that. And the bigger the code gets and the more complicated it gets, the more complicated it gets to understand uh, why our application is performing poorly. So if this is our application that performs poorly for some reason, we want to tell why, and preferably as fast as we can. But like any other application, it does not just run by itself, right? It has the Linux kernel underneath. And for most of us, the Linux kernel looks like just a black box. eBPF is and uh, it stands for Extended Berkeley Pocket Filters. And basically what it gives us is that we can write tiny Python programs and connect them to a predefined hooks, whether in the Linux kernel or our user space application. 
those tiny programs can be thought of as sensors, as small sensors that you can connect to either the kernel or your application and, get, and then get useful metrics from. eBPF programs are very performant and they are very safe. Uh, performance issues uh, come in different shapes and sizes and they can introduce high spikes in latencies or a, a, a degradation in throughput of our systems. So the most important thing to understand here is that these performance issues can cost a lot of money to our company. If it's a high frequency trading company like Final, where our trades will uh, get executed not fast enough, or it's uh, some company like Uber or Netflix where the users get poor experience. And we don't want that. So let's see uh, a real-life example. Imagine we have, we have a server that has sudden spike in the number of processes being spawned. Now, as a developer, I want to investigate it. I want to tell exactly what, what's going on. So what I would like to do, for starters, is just to print uh, some, it's just to monitor every time a process is spawned in the system. Now, how would you do that? Well, with eBPF and Python, this is really easy. In Linux, every process that is being spawned goes through a sysclone system call. So all we need to do is connect this tiny sensor uh, to this hook and uh, get, get what we want. So here's an example. We use here the BCC uh, Python module. Uh, this is our sensor. You see the sensor string? Uh, and we just print hello world every time any process in the system is spawned. Obviously, this is a very simple example. But I hope that you get an idea of what does it mean to write your own eBPF sensors. The meaning of writing your own BPF sensors is that you have to have at least some basic kernel knowledge. And, and most of people maybe don't have this knowledge. So luckily, there are more than 70 ready-to-use tools uh, with this, uh, in this BCC uh, toolkit. And you, you don't have to have any, any kernel knowledge to use them. So this is our black box kernel. And those tools shed a lot of light into the inner kernel processes. And they make the kernel look something like this. We have predefined hooks in the Linux kernel, starting from 4.7, uh, something like this, for almost every interesting uh, point that we might want to trace. So it, it's a, whether it's a scheduler, file system, sockets, device drivers, system call interface, and even user space. And we'll talk about a uh, few of these tools. Syscount. The syscount tool is, uh, is acts like any other sensor. It connects to the system call interface. And it is very useful for characterizing our workload on the, on the host. For example, I can tell, hey, please give me, th there's my process running, you see the green thing? So I can tell, please tell me what system calls does this process use and sort them by, uh, from the slowest one to the, to, the time cons to the less time consuming one. So here we see the nano slip, takes us, I don't know how, ma how many time, but a lot of time. And then Futex, then write, then the clone system call, etc. Another example, is we can get system-wide, not just for any uh, process, we can get system-wide the top three uh, failing system calls. We can see that the receive message here is acting not, not very good, right? And then the futex and then the read system call. Another uh, very interesting tool is the off-CPU time tool. And can you guess what does it uh, what it does? We started the lecture with a 
yes, we started the lecture uh, with a deadlock example. So this tool is doing something amazing. It tells you what your application was doing while it was not running on the CPU and why. You can actually see that. Here is our, our example from previous. So here we are waiting on Futex wait, and then there we do a nano slip, and there are some other idle things. Uh, why would the application would be off CPU? Well, it can wait for disk. It can do I.O. on network. It can block on a lock, like we've seen. Or it just can wait for another process to finish its job. So all of these reasons, the off CPU time tool will tell us exactly where our application spends uh, its time. And I want to deep dive a bit on how it works, this specific tool, so you can better understand why it's performant and why you should use it. In the kernel, we have this finish task switch function. And the off CPU time connects uh, directly to it. This function has two tasks. It has the previous task that is going to sleep now, and it has the next task to be run by the scheduler. For the previous task, this tool, this sensor, takes the process stack trace and the timestamp. And when this process will schedule in the future, will be scheduled in the future, it will become the next task, and then we'll take its timestamp again. And then we will see how long we've spent on this uh, yellow stack trace. All the calculations are done within the kernel, so there is no user space to kernel uh, communication. And this is very performant, because we don't do much. We just, we just take the stack trace, the timestamp, and that's it on every context switch. We talked about uh, hooking into the kernel, but you can also hook into the user space. Specifically, you can hook to uh, the C Python interpreter, uh, starting from version 3.6. It does not come by, de by default, but you can just compile it. It's uh, pretty easy. So uh, let's see an example of it. So again, we want to hook into the C Python interpreter and write any ABPF uh, program that we might want. There's a tool called tplist. We just run it on the Python interpreter. And it shows us what hooks does the Python interpreter have. Has. There, uh, we will talk about the function entry uh, hook. Uh, the function entry hook is executed every time any Python function is called. So if we are not connecting any sensor to it, the, the actual assembly in this hook is just a bunch of knobs. So it does not uh, uh, hit your performance too much. It's just knob instructions. But once you connect your eBPF sensor to it, then uh, your sensor runs, and then you can do some uh, useful metrics for you. Let's see an example how we hook into the function entry uh, hook in the Python interpreter. So here's my uh, simple program. All it does is just calls my func every three seconds. That's it. And prints hello. Let's trace it. There's a quite kind of live demo here. Uh, there's a tool called TracePy. We tell it to connect to the function entry hook. And then we tell it to print Arg argument one, two, and three, which are uh, the file name, the func name, and the uh, line number. And it just prints us. And once we terminate it, that's it, it's fine. The program continues to run. We, we have our metrics. Not everything is perfect. Uh, things you, might, you might, must be aware of when using uh, eBPF is every program has the ma maximum of 4K eBPF assembly instructions. Uh, there are no loops er, uh, allowed. And there's a pretty poor uh, ecosystem currently because it's a quite new technology. And we don't have any IDEs or debugging tools for, the for these tiny programs. 
and no orchestration or version management whatsoever. So I believe that a lot of work will be done there and we'll get some uh, pretty good ecosystems for it. Now, if you're interested in this technology, you should go to this guy. It's, uh, his name is Brendan Gregg. He's a performance engineer at Netflix and he is a huge contributor to the BCC, eBPF and the Flame Graphs projects. Uh, you should really uh, go to his uh, blog post. Okay, um, questions? So it's, it's a great question. He, he has asked that uh, if the stack trace that we that we show is a, only a kernel stack or it's a user stack and kernel stack, correct? Okay, so it's both. We actually uh, go on, on the stack of the process and, and save it into um, EBPF data structure. They actually have a data structure for saving stacks. So, so then we, we just uh, give it to user space. So for your question, we have uh, the kernel stack and the, user, and the user stack. How does it work? Okay, it's a good question. I, it's only introduction to eBPF, but I, I will answer you. Uh, the kernel has some virtual, kind of a virtual machine inside. So what actually happens when you, when you, when you uh, write your sensor, the eBPF program, it compiles to a eBPF uh, architecture, not x86 or ARM or something like that, no. There's an arch actual architecture that is called BPF. And GCC and LLVM uh, support this architecture. So the kernel runs this assembly, and this is why it's very safe. And uh, I have a minute, how many time I have? Okay, okay, so uh, if you, uh, who, who knows what uh, TCP dump is? Okay, okay, good, <laughs> almost everyone. So when you use TCP dump, you actually write some filter, right? You write like a uh, host equals something. This filter is compiled uh, to a Berkeley, it's called Berkeley packet filter, okay? And it is actually compiled to some kind of assembly. It was invented by the Berkeley University in 1993. It's like a while ago with us. And eBPF is just the extension of it. Okay, so they, they took this concept of writing simple logic like filters in the user space and then bringing them to the kernel. And they made it a, a whole language, a whole architecture. So now you can write any program and connect to any predefined uh, hook in the kernel or user space. Does it answer your question? Okay. Okay, uh, one last thing. For all of uh, those who are still awake, Final is uh, looking for you. So uh, you can uh, refer to our website for open positions uh, or just come to me and I will be more than happy to explain everything you want. Thank you so much. Yeah.